So, um, the first of our uh, practical talks, um, the SLAM practical talk. Okay, welcome back. So, at the beginning of the week, we presented um, the achievements we wanted to have at the end of the week. So, basically, that everyone has a running um, out of the box ROS mapping solution on the PC and tried it with. The Hokuyo actually turned out that it was very practical to have these black Hokuyos because it's very easy to unplug them from one computer, put them in the other computer and test um, the software. And from that on we started recording um, the data in bags and um, we realized that this worked pretty well for all the participants. And so I think this topic was done rather quickly. And then it turned out that several people had, have certain interests and we continued working and during the presentation this afternoon we will have four short talks. The first will be by um, Ramirez and he will talk about the hassle he had kind of um, by using starting with Ross Electric and trying to connect to another <coughs> computer that has Ross Forte running, Grato running on it and how we handled that. We'll talk about the wiki that we created. This was one of the deliverables we wanted to produce. And he used this to set up his communication with another um, Raspberry Pi. And we'll show you the launch files that we produced to give you a kickstart in mapping and that we uploaded in the Subversion directory. The next talk will be a short presentation by um, Zanet. And she used two queues to um, to make mapping more reliable and faster on a U-bot. And this is actually a, a short, small screenshot she gave me. And what you see here, there is an X axis pointing this direction and this direction. And these are the X directions of the two queues that are mapping simultaneously now. And uh, Stefan helped her to extend Hectoslam, so Hectoslam can use two lasers now. A small part of the future world. <laughs> <laughs> That's all of um, 95%. Okay, um, one of the topics we introduced this week was to use the uh, Raspberry Pi, this little PC board, um, as a computer that collects the laser data. And one team around Ismail they used this Raspberry Pi here, and actually they built the mapping board. That's a one meter long board, you can see here. You could also call it a suspicious package. <laughs> There's a laser ray finder here, a Raspberry Pi here, a battery pack here, uh, antennas, wires. And with this board you can run through the arena and do some mapping And what we will try for almost the first time this afternoon is to put this board on their RHEX robot and drive it through the arena and we will see if the RHEX is able to, to map the arena. And last but not least, um, Stefan started putting the, the exploration stuff that Hector is already using in the competition together and make this exploration um, node also public. And, uh, we have seen some progress last night or at 3 o'clock this morning and we hope that we will finish that today and this would give us uh, um, the possibility to, um, to use the map to do some path planning and exploration. And also, and this is depicted here, we not only focused on Hectoslam this week, um, some teams with the help of Matt and Adam um, used uh, mapping the fast time solution from CARS and implemented that on their PCs and so they actually have now two um, complete mapping solutions, SLAM solutions on their PCs. Okay, so be sure to come back this afternoon for the presentations. The first two presentations and the fourth presentation will be given here in the classroom on the board and um, of course the mapping of the arena with the R hex, this point will be demonstrated. Okay, out there. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Okay, who is next? Gabriel. Gabriel. Or at least his representative. Yeah. Given the yeah. game. What, what's Gabriel doing? Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so he, he, told me, he told me he had an urgent appointment, he couldn't move. I think those, I think those may have been his words. <laughs> yes. Yes, convenient. <laughs> it's going to be uh, kind of a problem right now because uh, what we have actually built it uh, was based on, uh, on not getting the proper dimensions from the screen for the uh, website. <laughs> so, uh, okay, uh, unfortunately we don't have any presentation to show, but uh, we have built something and the main idea was that uh, we wanted to use what uh, Gabriel was already doing with uh, the HTML5 and the JavaScript implementation for graphical user interfaces. And uh, what we actually did was that uh, we also tried to test uh, how this can be also implemented in ROS. Uh, some, uh, some packages were already there, but uh, it, was, it isn't uh, yet fully implemented uh, on subscribing to topics for ROS. And uh, that's something that we can do in the future. Uh, what we actually did is that uh, we wanted to use what was already done in the uh, Rex robot. So Rex is actually running MATLAB, so right now we're doing a MATLAB simulation for this uh, graphical user interface that we developed. What you're seeing here is not actually what we developed, but uh, uh, it, because the dimensions of the screen are different, it's like uh, you have to scroll down. So uh, each one of the students got uh, one different part of the, of the graphical user interface we wanted to develop. And uh, the main idea was that we wanted to make it uh, look uh, as, uh, as cool as possible and yet uh, easy to understand for everyone to use. Uh, we wanted to, to hide all the, all the engineering values that had no, uh, no help for uh, the, uh, the user. So they would only appear if uh, something was problematic or something had, uh, had just failed. And uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to, to implement it, but we, we managed to, to get some of it working. And we also built a... I'm not sure it's showing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there seems to be an issue. <laughs> That's okay. The, we we all understand, of course, that these uh, impromptu demos are. Yeah, but uh, the, we actually built uh, uh, like a touchpad that you can uh, set a permanent state and, uh, and a non-permanent state, temporary state for the robot. So uh, we we gave it. Uh, According to the position that you would uh, click or double click, you will get uh, different velocities for the robot and uh, it would uh, automatically fade them out uh, and uh, make it uh, rest when it's not needed. Uh, we also built this inside this 3D model that uh, uh, Gabriel already had. We also integrated some of the sensor data. So right now you can see that the, the legs have different uh, colors. The colors are actually uh, based on thresholds and uh, red is like uh, it uh, consumes too much uh, uh, too much power, too much uh, amperes, uh, while green is um, uh, is not that uh, dangerous. And you can also get uh, graphical graphicals from the uh, from a moving window uh, perspective of uh, current or temperatures for the motors as well. And uh, this one. It uh, shows different uh, temperatures from the sensors from the six different motors. While on the other hand, this one shows the currents. Uh, 
It was actually built so that it can fit this wide screen, so it's supposed to work on this screen, but uh, right now it's not showing so much uh, of its potentials. Uh, I guess that's pretty much it. Okay, next. What was next? Ross? Getting the whole group on this time. Okay. <laughs> okay, so you're making you're making up for a lack of slides by having lots of people. <laughs> it's also right? colored. Oh, you're the, you're the pixels, right? I see. Yeah. It's the seven nations. <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, in the uh, Ross uh, software framework group, we had a quite different group with different interests and different state of knowledge, and uh, so we started with three different ideas. One was to get the robot running. Uh, one was to get into the Ross framework, and one is to work with the camera and the topic system. And I would suppose that everyone. Uh, or every group uh, explain for their own what they have done the last uh, the last week. Okay, uh, to start with uh, our uh, work and implementation, we came here with only uh, a metal framework and uh, wheels and motor. Uh, right now, we can uh, use the laser scanner, uh, IMU, and. Uh, Motor control over Arduino with ROS. Uh, that was pretty much for us, uh, an achievement for us. Uh, we also had our several sensors running with ROS. We, for, at the first time, had uh, problems uh, with laser scanner, IMU, and Arduino, and motor controller. But now we are, uh, we have all those working with, uh, and compatibly with ROS. So that was a pretty much achievement for us. We also collaborated with other guys. Uh, we uh, we get their joystick uh, code for us, and now we can also control the robot through joystick. Uh, that was uh, what we did uh, for with uh, last week. Yeah. yeah so uh, Sato and myself uh, work together. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer, so my background in ROS and C++ uh, was severely limited at uh, the beginning of the week. So it was a, a pretty steep learning curve. Um, but basically what we did was we um, got ROS working properly. We um, downloaded the joystick packages um, to that we could use the Xbox controller to interface with the, uh, with the wheeled robot. Um, and then we created a teleop node so that we could take the take the joystick messages that were published on the joint topic um, and convert them modified and scaled um, to, to the needs um, of the ROS serial uh, package that they have running on their uh, Arduino. I think that sort of worked quite well. Yeah. Just summarized for me also. Okay, for me. Um, yes, my name is B. I'm a member of our lab team. And we, uh, we bring the robot here, the uh, autonomous, autonomous platform here, and we hope that uh, at the end of uh, this week we can uh, we can create our own our our own package to uh, to run the robot autonomously, autonomously, and then first I try to create a image processing node to. Uh, capture the QR code, and then my friend uh, build the node to communicate uh, with the serial port uh, to control the robot. And uh, also, now we can combine this node together here, and I think uh, my robot is can work. Mm -hmm. uh, you also okay. like to say something? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the. I'm oh, sorry. No. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>
So there's a few questions. So the developments, um, I guess they'll be pushed upstream. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. You're done with the technical here? Yeah. <coughs> question to the leader. Yeah? What's the dance? Last <laughs> <laughs> What do you call that? What is it? What what is it? Is it? Which which dance? I can put a lot of What do you what do you like the video? <laughs> <laughs> can, it cannot be that bad. <laughs> Actually, you're right. We've got a um, we we need we need um, honestly to put up a uh, a robot dance Ross package. I think um, inspi inspired by his own moves. <laughs> uh, so was there a, um, so, so the, um, what you've developed here, have you pushed upstream so that other people can make, make use of this? You know, if, be, it, be it packages or instructions or experiences? Yeah, it was, for us, was quite difficult because main, most of the questions was part of the con, uh, system controlling and mm. very mechanical and electrical things, and that's not <laughs> part of our... Um, Knowledge, so but brilliant. So it sounds like there's been a good, good Ross uh, yes. yeah. development yeah. process, and um, you know, I think you'll gain, gain a lot of knowledge. So thank you, Hans. Okay, who's next? I think yeah. you guys. You are still putting visuals in. Okay, you gazebo wants to go first. Uh, yeah, yeah. Gazebo's yeah. ready. Okay, we'll have gazebo. <laughs> I just didn't start. They are kind of small. Meh, happens. What are you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Simulated robots. Basically, we have a negotiator model. We have a point man model. That's the robot with a stick on it that it can use to climb stairs. And uh, Richard actually is as far as uh, that it really climbs simulated stairs in Gazebo. So you can actually do the same thing in simulation that the real robot does. Uh, and of our uh, we have simulation of our small six wheel uh, lightweight and a ground vehicle. Uh, for environments, we have. A generator tool that uh, Dietma did that uh, generates step fields or a jungle gym scenario with uh, yeah, two layers of uh, geometry and, and sticks between them. And yeah, originally I wanted to show everything in live demo right now, but it turns out not everything in SVN is already running on my computer, so we probably have to do some cross-validation. But um, the generated models by Geekmar are, are already running on my computer, so that you can see here. So here's the step field. Yes, this general gym scenario, and yeah, I can drive around in here. So, and as you can see, the collisions are kind of correct. As you can see, our robot is more mobile right now in simulation than it is in real life. So we definitely need some validation then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the cool thing is, and that is what I just wanted to look up, just to give you an idea how that works. Um, I was just in the process of opening the file when I saw the presentation. <laughs> Why not? Um, <laughs> So this is uh, how this general gym generator looks like. 
um, you basically have a ground, the, the ground plane and the ceiling plane, and then you just put in the numbers that you want to connect from bottom to top. And by that you can just generate the geometry for this model. So you can easily generate new things to test the robots. And the same goes for, for the step fields. This looks very similar. So you can just give the, the height of the step field elements and it will automatically generate the mesh for you. Yeah, and the other robots hopefully will be shown uh, later today. I just didn't get them to work so quickly. Yeah. So that's basically it and more to come yeah, later today. And of course everywhere, uh, thanks to all the guys who did the actual work on, on this. So you say a negotiated module there? Yes. So they constructed here? Yes. Cool. We with the little wheels or tracks? Uh, with little, I think six wheels right now, so right. it's not as complicated. Adam, how are the visuals going? Uh, still working. <laughs> Fun? My last. Um, and Claude, how are we going? I'm just going to talk, so. Okay. Um, for the demonstrations later, uh, Rizzo and Peter are going to show um, step, step through the sequences of machine learning that, that we talked about earlier. Um, and you saw a talk this morning about the plane uh, detection. One of the problems with machine learning is the first thing you need is data. So almost all the time that uh, people spent in the group was, was trying to figure out how to collect data. Um, uh, unfortunately, so part, part, of, part of the attempt was to move away from using the um, there is a specialized stuff that's sorry, a specialized CAS robot to using the point cloud library to do the de plane detection and also detecting some people <coughs> and detecting other kinds of primitives. The problem is that the point cloud library plane detection is broken. Um, but sort of, there's problems with it. So um, that needs to be worked on. The other thing that this highlights is that if people do want to do machine learning and rescue, um, I think Reza might want to bring this up again too, is that while in other object recognition domains, there are <coughs> databases for doing training. Uh, there aren't much for rescue. So one thing that could come out of this workshop is, is an effort to try to collect and create repositories of training data, especially point clouds and other things, but of, of rescue scenarios so that people can do machine learning exercises uh, and use the data and, and will have properly labeled and verified data sets that people could train against. So I think that would be a good outcome of this workshop is if people sort of take this away and start collecting data and we, we can set up a, a repository uh, so that people everywhere can use it for training. So, anyway, so, so we'll have the demos later on. Thank you so much, Paul. <laughs> so getting some of this, um, you know, some more machine learning, some more, uh, I guess, um, un understanding of, the, of what the robots are seeing is, um, is vital here. So we hope that... Um, that the efforts of Claude and Reza to um, try and introduce some of these concepts means that you'll all have a bit more of a uh, an understanding of what these th what these um, methods are capable of, and hopefully we can start as a community generating these data sets, generating this experience um, for uh, you know, to, to advance um, the application of, uh, of machine learning for better on to give our robots better understanding of what they're doing and hopefully better autonomy, better. Um, assistive behaviors and all that. So thank you so much, Ford and Reza, for helping us with that. And of course, thank you, Matthew. Thank you so much, Matt, if you're there for uh, fighting the uh, mechanical <laughs> mecha mechanical problems with the um, with the negotiator. Adam. Uh, okay, one more. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give you what I get. Yeah, and because we've got good stuff, what I'll do is I'll finish this and then I'll just project it up here so it's in a, like a loop so everyone can see what it is and it'll be self-explanatory at that point. Alright, so just generally, let's just say, alright, so we have the responders and some uh, new uh, Oops, new folks who are 
interested in getting involved in development of standard test methods. We focused on the standard test method side of the house rather than the robot design, uh, which is perfectly appropriate and fine. Um, Max and their dongles. There you go. <coughs> So what I have um, generally is uh, we're going to start from, I don't know if you remember uh, Harry's talk specifically, but we have a picture of him actually deployed with his canine, with his structural engineer, with his search can. And we're going to annotate that screenshot of his uh, to show you all the opportunities for robots in there. That's what I need to get done here. Um, what you need to understand is the flow of their uh, of their search strategy and why they can't go into some places that look like you ought to be able to go in there. And it's because of the structural uh, danger uh, to them. Before they know this, if they heard someone screaming, believe me, they're in there. But until that happens and they're doing a, a primary search, uh, looking for entombed victims, uh, it's not happening because it's just too unsafe. So advanced tools, that's where we come in. So uh, some of the things we're trying to do here is to make sure obviously mobility keeps up, right? We're always pushing our mechanical engineers at least to come up with new and different ways of uh, getting through the tough environments. Survivability is important. Everyone needs to pay attention to durability. Uh, but we have some new mobility obstacles that we're working on uh, to just amp up RoboCup Rescue League a little bit each year. You know, remember, the arenas move as fast as the fastest players in the room. We can't wait for everyone to get good at each component. We need to rely on each other to disseminate best-in-class solutions, and we require everyone to adopt it to stay competitive. Right? We're trying to move toward the application domain while teaching people how to get involved. So we're balancing both forces. So we'll show you some new advanced mobility features. Subhuman sized voids. We, we hit that pretty hard this week. What we're going for there are tangling obstacles. Tangling obstacles take place in the ant farm apparatus where you come in the top and you traverse over and you drop down, you traverse over and you drop down. We're going to start bringing the ceiling down to make those more confined. Uh, the tangling obstacles will be hanging wires. Um, we also had we also adopted some uh, stuff that Setsu was proving in the uh, Japan Open with the uh, hinged um, downward pipes, uh, so that robots, when they bump into things, some things don't give, some things do give. They need to have a little better understanding of where their shoulders are and where their sensors are to move through an environment with leaning collapse features, nothing is vertical, everything is slightly angled. Uh, we did a uh, structural box crib shoring out there, which I have a picture of, actually so I have pictures of some of these. This is the mobility test, the stairs, same old stairs up to 45 degrees in Robocup. We took this idea that uh, Japan Open proved with the sticks going across it, and we made this a measurable, repeatable, feature for occluded stairs. You remember from Setsu's talk that that RoboCup robot, Quince, got further than any other robot up the stairs, any other commercial robot that was deployed there, but got stopped ultimately at the top of that last set of stairs, mainly because there were some things leaning on the stairs. It wasn't completely impassable, but it was enough. RoboCup, you saw from the from uh, Jukrit's talk, has been making you steer with obstacles on stairs to try to make sure you're not just turning and gunning it, this is the next step where you're actually crawling over some things. The idea is not to break any sticks, but you don't get clean stairs to work with in the finals or in the advanced mobility phase of uh, RoboCup. This is roughly what he was presenting and this is a uh, sort of a mock-up that we're going to try to go to as just another feature for obstacles such as they did in the Japan Open. Okay, so this is what I don't have particularly well featured here. This is a box that you're going to see. There's a cube out there, open on one side, but it's going to be completely enclosed 
with nothing but access holes like this big. And this is where they're sticking the aces in this case in on a stick and rotating it and trying to do their you know stitching and and uh, modeling the interior. All the blocks are in known locations and they're numbered and lettered so that we can start getting teams after they probe it <laughs> to model it and then give us dimensions from any set of blocks that we choose. So that's how we can randomize to make sure that your model is complete, that you got rid of all the shadows you needed to, and that uh, it's accurate in terms of 3D measurements. So you'll see that out there closed up and hopefully we'll get some, you know, a computer there where you can just play with it and uh, maybe display the output. And uh, I guess the last is, the, this is the box shore. Uh, this is a crib shore. Box crib shore. Box crib shore. <laughs> this is any post, structural element. These two columns right here holding up this wall, this, this ceiling. This is what we're talking about. This is a small one so that we could have small blocks to start with. Although this turned out to be 60 centimeters, we're talking about a 60 centimeter piece of wood and a 1.2 meter piece of wood. To build these rather simple structures in a RoboCup arena, um, we're thinking that this size might be just barely capable from a single manipulator point of view. The longer ones will probably inspire dual manipulator just to be able to deal with the the weight and the uh, you know the, the length of it, the awkwardness, but the construction technique is very simple. They're totally achievable, and you'll be graded on how many layers you can get, let's say up to ten, and how well you're formed these joints. All these joints, all these gaps are just one cube, one cubic unit of the wood. So there is a correct. And a 3D scan would give you a pretty good uh, estimate of how correct you are. And we can start deducting some points for every centimeter you're off. Something like that. Subtracting from 100 centimeters. So 10 levels and 100 points to spend. And when we're doing this robotically, it's because that robot is under that building that I wish I got the picture up here for, but I will. That robot was in there first. In order for responders to get in there, this has to happen get in there safely, or this is the first thing they're going to have to do. So if they could just pass wood in to the robot to start this process, uh, we're, doing, we're doing a good thing. Also keep in mind, getting all this wood downrange is a big deal. Remember, they didn't walk right up to this building with a pile of wood. They're back at the base of operations. Uh, Getting the wood to the site is a, another low-hanging piece of fruit for robots. Waypoints at both ends, a navigable pathway that they walked down, so they define the path for you, and we just need the robots to retro-traverse that path back and forth, bring ambulatory victims out, or non-ambulatory victims, anyone who could sit on a robot that could carry wood, gets a free ride out, anyone, then the robot comes back in with supplies be really good. We might try to work that into RoboCup 2 uh, to get through the arena because it's it's so doable. Uh, I guess lastly, the pan tilt zoom test test in the hallway that you've been walking by. We're going to try to run a test today, probably with a negotiator, just to walk people through, walk the responders through what that test looks like, to validate it, to make sure they think that is a reasonable approximation of clearing a room with some certainty. And uh, that's it. You know, a wide variety of stuff uh, going on, but we were, we were doing pretty well. Any questions? Okay, good. Okay, so it's terrific to um, have some actual standard test method development, and I, I think um, Adam's got some more. Uh, people converted over to the um, standard test method development team. Is that correct? Yes, they sold some <laughs> unsuspecting young folks. Yes. You've got to watch Adam, he has a habit of doing that. Um, I can speak from experience. <laughs>